Tonight, we're honored to have Eustace Mullins, an author from the grand state of Virginia. And he has written numerous books. And this is such a great introduction here. It runs about 20 minutes. But uh, we'll make it a little shorter than that. <clears throat> so to introduce Eustace, after 40 years of continuous activity in the American conservative movement, Eustace Mullins has garnered an impressive number of firsts. The first writer to have a book burned in Europe since World War II, the first person to be fired from the staff of the Library of Congress for political reasons, and the first writer to detail the history of our Federal Reserve System. A native Virginian, Eustace Mullins is a direct descendant of William Mullins, who wrote the Mayflower Compact, a governmental code written at the behest of the Mayflower settlers and the first governing code composed in the New World. He served 38 months in the U.S. Army Air Force during World War II, and subsequently studied at Washington and Lee University, Ohio State University, University of North Dakota, New York University, Escuela de Bellas Artes, San Miguel de Allende, Mexico, and the Institute of Contemporary Arts, Washington, D.C. His groundbreaking work was largely the result of a fortuitous circumstance. He became successively the protege of Ezra Pound, the leading literary force of the 20th century, George Simpson, founder of the National Press Club and the most widely quoted journalist in Washington, and H.L. Hunt, the anti-communist entrepreneur. After Ezra Pound's passing, Eustace Mullins founded the Ezra Pound Institute of Civilization, which carries on Pound's important work in literature and economics. And I, again, I'm very honored to have Eustace here. He's here on vacation. And uh, he granted us the opportunity to speak here, have him speak for us, and share us some incredible insight. He's been on uh, many, many talk shows all over the country, even on national television on the Morton Downey Show. Without further ado, let me just give a warm aloha to Eustace Mullins. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming this evening. My first question I have to ask you is, do you know where your government is tonight? Because you think of our government as being in Washington, D.C., more likely it is in New York, it is in London, it is in Paris, it is everywhere, but not in the hearts of the people. When we speak of our government, we think of what our educationists call it, a democracy. It is not. It is a republic in which we, the people, choose our representatives to act in our stead and for our welfare on a local level, on a state level, and on the national level, and also on the international level. We do have a constitution. That constitution was drafted by men who had rebelled against tyranny, and they wanted to ensure that their progeny would not be the victims of an evil tyranny, an alien government such as they had suffered under for so many years. Because of that, the Constitution was intended solely as a safeguard for the people. It was not and has never been intended as an instrument of government per se. Thomas Jefferson said, bind them down by the chains of the Constitution where they can do no mischief. This is the problem with government, that it does mischief. It falls into the hands of mischievous people, people who have allegiances which we do not know about, people who have programs which we do not know about, and people who intend us no good. My my experience with all this began some 42 years ago when I was asked to go to St. Elizabeth's Hospital to meet a political prisoner who was being held without trial. His name was Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound had three disciples who were awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. That was James Joyce, T.S. Eliot, and uh, Ernest Hemingway. And I had the great privilege of becoming probably the final disciple of Ezra Pound at a time when he had committed himself totally to research in the international 
monetary monopoly and the machinations of sinister persons who were, by devious means, working their will upon all the peoples of the world. At the time I had met Ezra Pound, he had already put in 30 years of research on these subjects. He turned over all of that research to me. He asked me to go to the Library of Congress. He said, I want you to see what you can find out about the Federal Reserve System. I said, the Federal Reserve System? What in the world is that? He pulled out a dollar from his pocket, and there on the top it said, Federal Reserve System. That was the first time I had ever known there was such an agency in the United States. At that time, it was never mentioned in the press. When I began my research, I found out that during the 1920s, the New York Times index mentioned the Federal Reserve System in that 10-year period. They mentioned it three times. The resulting book, which Ezra Pound edited for me, guided me through its writing, was then turned down by a number of the leading publishers in New York. Even a so-called conservative publishing house called Devin Adair. I took it to the publisher, Devin Garrity. He read it. He came out and he talked to me. He said, Mr. Mullins, we cannot publish this book. But if you have anything else, I'd be very interested in printing it. Do you have a novel? Do you have any other book? I said, no, this is the book that I've written. This is the book I want to have published. He said, I'm sorry, but we cannot do it. He said, here in New York, we're under the guns of the banking houses. We wouldn't dare print your book. And he said, I won't give you any assurance that anyone else will be able to print it. Well, he was right. I finally found a friend named John Casper, who's... Uh, I knew a girl who had some money. She put up $1,000. We printed 1,000 copies of Mullins on the Federal Reserve in 1952. The book sold out almost immediately. And then about a year later, we published 100,000 under the name of the Federal Reserve Conspiracy. Those books were sent to every member of Congress, every member of the state legislatures, and the receipt of those books was met with a resounding silence. Because the information in my book was not information that these people wanted to hear. They did not want to know what I had discovered through my researches, that the Federal Reserve System had been drafted and had been pushed through Congress solely as the result of a conspiracy. You may have seen the news recently that there was a terrible hurricane which hit the islands of South Carolina, South Georgia. There's an island there called Jekyll Island, Georgia, which is uh, historically known as the Millionaire's Retreat. This is where the international bankers met in November of 1910 to draft a plan for a central bank. These men were Paul Warburg, a German immigrant, who was a partner of the banking house of Kuhn Loeb Company in New York. The meeting was chaired by Senator Nelson Aldrich, who in 1904 had married John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Senator Aldrich was known in Washington as the tool of the big banks, the big monopolies. He was the Republican majority leader of the Senate. He was there strictly because of his political background. He contributed nothing to the actual drafting of the central bank plan, which was done mostly by Paul Warburg. Paul Warburg had served his apprenticeship in Europe in the House of Rothschild. His banking house in New York, Kuhn Loeb, was the principal representative of the Rothschild banks in the United States. Also present at this meeting was Henry Davison, the right-hand man of J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan was at that time the most famous banker in the world. He also was the secret representative of the House of Rothschild in the United States. J.P. Morgan died in 1913, the year that the federal income tax uh, was enacted by Congress. And it was discovered that this world-famous banker, this great capitalist, 
only had a very small fortune. He was simply a flunky. William A. Rockefeller made the comment when he heard of his passing. He said, and to think, he wasn't even a rich man. And he wasn't. His son, J.P. Morgan Jr., had to sell off part of his estate to pay his bills to art dealers such as the Duveen brothers. He was heavily in debt. Yet this was the man who was famed throughout the world as a bloated capitalist, as a great banker, as the symbolism of the money power in the United States. So what you see in the media is quite often not the reality. It is a smoke screen which has been carefully laid to obscure reality and to prevent you from knowing who is doing what to whom. Now, when these gentlemen drafted their central bank plan at Jekyll Island, Georgia, they did not then publicize it as a secret plan put together by a conspiracy meeting without the knowledge of the American people. Instead, they launched a national campaign using various fake organizational names and unlimited funds to advise the American people that they desperately needed a Federal Reserve Bank in the United States. In the campaign of 1912, the, this secret plan was put before the American people by the Republican Party as the Aldrich Plan. The Aldrich Plan was immediately denounced by the Democratic political leaders as the plan of the big banks, as the plan of the bloated capitalists. So the Democrats said, we have our own plan. So they advanced their plan, which they called the Federal Reserve Bank System. And it was exactly the same as the Aldrich Plan. However, no journalist at that time seemed to be astute enough to notice the great similarities between the two plans. And of course, what they were doing, they were setting up uh, uh, things for themselves. They were stacking the deck as usual. If the Republicans had won the 1912 election, we would have had an Aldrich Bank. But the Democrats won, and so we had a Federal Reserve Bank system. After the election of 1912, they began an intensive campaign to put this new bill through Congress. Of course, they had the total support of the entire Eastern establishment. The Midwest, and particularly in the Western states, they opposed it violently because the people of those states had always been victimized by the Eastern banks. And you had a congressman from Minnesota, Charles Augustus Lindbergh, Sr., who denounced this plan. He said it will set up the greatest money trust on earth. It will sell the American people and their children into slavery. We will rue the day that we have passed this act. So Charles Lindbergh led the battle against this plan. He did not have the money. He did not have the political support to oppose it. And so it was signed into law on December the 23rd, 1913, by President Woodrow Wilson. Now, the New York Times noted that never before had any bill of such importance to the people been rushed through with such strange maneuverings behind the scene. It was traditional in Congress to adjourn about the 15th of December and for the congressmen to begin the long trek back to their homes in the Midwest and the West. After most of the principal opponents had left, they rushed this thing through on December 23rd. That could have been challenged later on, but once it had been signed into law by the President of the United States, there was no more public criticism. In 1914, they organized the 12 Federal Reserve Banks. The American people had no idea that there was only one Federal Reserve Bank, the Bank of New York, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which was controlled by five big New York banks, which in turn were controlled by three 
subsidiary banks of the Bank of England in London. The other 11 banks, as was pointed out later, were simply so much expensive window dressing. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York has always been the money center bank. The other banks have rubber stamped whatever monetary proposals were advanced by the president of that bank. And he himself simply represented those five banks which held the controlling 53% of stock in that bank. Now, in 1984, I went to the uh, chief administrator of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, Joseph A. Coyne, in Washington. I just dropped in on him. I stopped at the Federal Reserve Building. I said, I'm going to catch this guy. I had ordered from the Federal Reserve Board the original organizational certificates <coughs> of each of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks in 1914, which showed exactly which banks bought how much stock, and those banks exist today, and they own, own substantially the same amount of stock today. There have been mergers, there have been transfers, but because the Federal Reserve System was set up as a monopoly, they provided in the Federal Reserve Act that the stock could not be bought sold or traded. Therefore, you have never been able to buy a single share of stock in any Federal Reserve Bank because there is not a stockbroker in the country who can obtain a share for you at any price. This has never been publicized. It's not known by the American people. We are given to understand, and congressmen have been queried by their constituents as to whether the Federal Reserve Banks are government banks. The congressmen have usually replied, yes, indeed, they are government banks. When the fact is that the government has never owned a single share of stock in any Federal Reserve Bank. The 12 Federal Reserve Banks each issued their own stock. That stock was subscribed to by banks in their district. There were 12 districts. And if that bank happened to go out of business later on, that stock had to be turned back into the Federal Reserve System. There was no way that you could buy a bank which had a voice in the operation of the Federal Reserve System and then give yourself an entree into the manipulation of our money and credit for the benefit of private stockholders. They set up a monopoly and they have maintained that monopoly to this day again without the knowledge and consent of the American people. When my book was published in 1952, there was no general knowledge of any of these facts. Ezra Pound told me, these, he said, these people have conspired to gain control of the money and the credit of the people of the United States. And that exact, is exactly what they have done. But because over the intervening years, this book has been uh, circulated widely, there have even been three plagiarized editions of it uh, printed and sold in the last 25 years. And therefore, today, almost any time that you pick up a paper, you, on the financial page, you will see some reference to the Federal Reserve System. This was unheard of before 1950 or 1960. I read in the Wall Street Journal a few days ago that a congressman, <coughs> Congressman Hamilton, had introduced a bill to rip away the veil of secrecy from the meetings of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. And because he had introduced this bill, the chairman of that board, Alan Greenspan, had invited this congressman to lunch at the Marble Palace on Constitution Avenue, the Federal Reserve Board uh, building. So. Congressmen are beginning to get into that building, which has been closed to them for many years. As I said, I walked into that building, and I went up to see Joseph Coyne, and his secretary said, Mr. Coyne can only give you a couple of minutes because he has to go to a meeting. I said, that's quite all right. I just wanted to stop by and speak to him for a moment. So I went in, and he seemed a little uneasy, and I found out later that the 
Federal Reserve Board Library for the, a small monetary library for the Board of Governors downstairs, had every copy of the various editions of my books in that library. So they weren't missing any bets. So I uh, asked Joseph Coyne about the voting rights of the various banks who held stock in the Federal Reserve Banks. He said, let me assure you that even if a bank has only two shares, that they have the same voting rights as the Chase Bank, which has 15,000 shares. Now, anyone who believes that would believe in the tooth fairy from now on. So I didn't argue with him too much about that. And then I, uh, I asked him, I said, you know, there must have been a lot of interest in those uh, organizational certificates that I ordered from the board. He said, you know, since 1914, you're the first person who ever ordered those certificates. So I reprinted them, and I, I circulated a few of them. But I didn't bring any with me this evening. But um, they are available, and they're quite interesting reading because this puts you right in on the ground floor. Now let us ask, what has been the effect of the conspiracy of November 1910 and the enactment of the Federal Reserve uh, Act in 1913 by Congress? Well, the dollar of 1913 has exactly one cent of purchasing power in 1989. That is what the conspirators have done for us. I was in the Smithsonian Museum a few years ago, and they have a monetary exhibit, which is quite interesting, in the American History Building. And they had a very cursory exhibit of Federal Reserve notes. And there was one note, a $100,000 note, Federal Reserve, which had the picture of Woodrow Wilson himself on it. And so I think anyone who had one of those notes would be very happy indeed. And that's the only one I've ever seen is the one. They were in banks. Also, the early issues of the Federal Reserve notes, 1914 to 1920, are now commanding premium prices. A, a 1916 Federal Reserve bank note for $20 recently sold uh, to a coin collector for $4,500. So there's been quite an inflation, not only in uh, the purchasing power, but also in the value of the early Federal Reserve notes. Now, one of the things that people have asked me over the years is, what is the connection of the Internal Revenue Service with the Federal Reserve System? And that led me into some very interesting research. First of all, the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 designates the Federal Reserve System as the fiscal agent of the entire United States government. Now, you know we have a Treasury Department, but the, the Act of 1913 superseded the Treasury Department and replaced it with the Federal Reserve System. And probably you don't know that all that money that you paid to the Internal Revenue Service never goes near any government agency. It is trucked directly to a Federal Reserve Bank. I was told that by Paul Desfosses, who himself had been a, an Internal Revenue Service agent for 23 years. And you have recently had a Taxpayer Bill of Rights passed by the Congress. Paul Desfosses was interviewed by the Washington Post a couple of months ago, and he told his interviewer he said that act is mere window dressing. He said that it gives no protection whatsoever to the taxpayer. He said, furthermore, Congress does not expect any IRS agent to act according to the principles of the Taxpayer's Bill of Rights because Congress needs more and more money for the billions of spendthrift and giveaway projects which they're engaged in and from which they get their graft and kickbacks, and therefore, no congressman is going to support any help for the American people in the way of tax reform. In fact, the uh, principal goal of every congressman in Washington, whether he meant, wants to come out and say so or not, is to raise more taxes so that he can spend more money. 
Now, after the Federal Reserve System went into operation as the fiscal agent of the United States, they were authorized to print elastic currency. Paul Warburg had been publicizing for 10 years before the, he wrote the Federal Reserve Act. He had been publicizing in the need for a more elastic currency. Now, what does elastic currency mean? Well, if you ever wrote a rubber check, you know what elastic currency is. Elastic currency is something you could stretch far beyond its original value and have it cover many more bills than it was ever intended to cover. So now that the Federal Reserve System was authorized to print as a bank of issue, that is a central bank, the definition of a central bank, which Thomas Jefferson invaded against in 1793 when Alexander Hamilton wanted to set up the first bank of the United States. A central bank has the power to print money. A central bank also is owned and controlled by private stockholders. It may have a government name. It may call itself the Bank of England, the Bank of France, the Federal Reserve System, but it is a privately owned money monopoly which has a license to print money. If you do it, they call you a counterfeiter. If the Federal Reserve System does it, they call it a public service. It costs them a half a cent to print a $100 bill. And that money is issued against government bonds, which are also issued by the Federal Reserve System. Your government buys those bonds gives the Federal Reserve System a bookkeeping entry of the full value, $1 billion, $10 billion, and begins to pay them interest on this book-created money. Then the dollar bills which you carry in your pocket are issued against those interest-bearing government bonds. Now, early on when I was working with Ezra Pound there at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, he said, well, you've got to learn the difference between interest-bearing and non-interest-bearing currency. Well, he might as well have been talking Greek. I hadn't the faintest idea what he meant. But I later found out that President Abraham Lincoln had issued greenback money during the Civil War because he rebelled against the 19% interest, which was being charged him by the New York bankers on government loans to fight the Civil War. So Abraham Lincoln said, I have the constitutional authority to order the Treasury to print greenback notes, and he did so. And they were non-interest-bearing currency. So he was assassinated, and they went back to printing interest-bearing currency. In 1963, we had another president who said, I'm going to authorized the issuance of non-interest-bearing currency from the Treasury Department. And he did so, and he was assassinated in Dallas. And the next president, Lyndon B. Johnson, immediately rescinded the Treasury notes of 1963, and we went back to interest-bearing currency. So you see, it's pretty dangerous for a president to get into non-interest-bearing currency. We've lost a couple of presidents that way, and I think if anyone else tried it, we'd lose them too. But the immediate effect of the creation of the Internal Revenue Service was to sop up this enormous outpouring of paper money by the Federal Reserve System. This money was printed and it was issued in various forms to the people as wages, salary, interest, so forth. But they had to constantly keep a tight control over it so that it wouldn't get out of hand, so that you would not have a runaway inflation such as you had in France uh, uh, during the Revolution, and you had the inflation of the continental currency after the American Revolution, and you had the inflation of the German mark in 1923 in Germany. So the function of the Internal Revenue Service, it's sort of like a garbage service to go around and sop up the excess money and keep the whole money-making system from getting out of hand. And that's what the Internal Revenue Service does. And that's why they are so in, uh, in, in um, 
so cruel to the American people because they cannot give an inch. They have to get that money away from you and get it back so that the entire monetary system will not collapse. I take this up in my new book, uh, The Rape of Justice. I have two chapters on taxation. That a banker said, if anyone ever paid a debt in cash, the entire uh, money system would collapse because it's a, it's a paper house of cards and they have to keep it in balance at all times and it's extremely vulnerable and it can collapse at any time. This is why people are constantly talking about a coming recession, a monetary collapse, because the people who are printing and issuing this money know better than anyone else that a collapse can come at any time. So people frequently ask me, well, when is the collapse coming? And um, it's sort of like asking, when is the next hurricane going to hit the coast of South Carolina? Because it, it is definitely going to come, and when it comes, there will be devastation. Now, we have had, in the past 50 years, we have seen the Democratic Party of the United States taken over by the Stalinist wing of the Communist Party. It has been later opposed by the Trotskyites, who call themselves anti-communist. Many people believe that the Republican Party, which came into power in 1980, is a strongly anti-communist party. That is a misconception because it is actually an anti-Stalinist party and it is committed to battling to the death the Stalinist wing of the Communist Party, which is enthroned in the Democratic Party of the United States. How did this come about? In 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president with the support of Bela Moskowitz of New York, who was one of the chief organizers of the Communist Party and a lifelong Stalinist. She was the one who inducted Adam Spy, Julius Rosenberg, into the Communist Party. So when Roosevelt came into power, he had a secret communist cell called the Harold Ware cell, which composed the leading bureaucrats in the Roosevelt administration. These men were all hardcore Stalinists. Well, in uh, Russia, during the 1920s, you had a split between the factions of the Communist Party. You had the Stalinist Party, which wanted socialism in one country, and you had the Trotskyite wing, which wanted continued worldwide revolution until communism had become the governing force in every country in the world. So Stalin, as a practical Marxist uh, materialist, believed it was better to establish socialism in Russia, and set an example for other countries, Trotsky insisted that we must have worldwide revolution at once. So the Stalinist wing of the party ousted Leon Trotsky, and because he continued to be a divisive force in the face of the uh, World War II, Stalin had him murdered in Mexico City in 1940. This gave the Trotskyites a martyr, they were headquartered in New York City under the name of the League for Industrial Democracy, which was a Rockefeller-financed organization. Now, when Ronald Reagan came to Washington in 1980, he came in as a hardline anti-communist, and his whole cabinet and his staff were supposed to be hardline anti-communist. Who were these anti-communists? They were from the League for Industrial Democracy. They came from the Hoover Institution and Stanford University in California. 86% uh, of, Rose, of uh, Reagan's transition team in Washington in 1980 was recruited directly at the Hoover Institution, which had been set up by Herbert Hoover, a Rothschild agent, after World War I to obscure the causes of World War I. So they have an immense depository of sealed records there at the Hoover Institution, 
most of which are not available to scholars. Many of them are sealed for many years to come, but they achieved their purpose. So Ronald Reagan, coming from California, recruited his staff at the Hoover Institution, which was run by two lifelong socialists, Sidney Hook and Seymour Martin Lipset, both of whom were directors of the Trotskyite League for Industrial Democracy. Now we had another prominent member of the board of the League for Industrial Democracy, a lady who became famous world over as a hardline anti-communist at the United Nations. That was Jean Kirkpatrick, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. She continually baited and railed at the Soviets throughout her stay in, in uh, New York at the United Nations. But she was doing it as a director of the League for Industrial Democracy, not for the government of the United States. Jean Kirkpatrick has a quite an interesting background. She is the wife of Evron Kirkpatrick. I'm sure you've never heard of him. He's one of those faceless bureaucrats who has guided the destiny of this country for many years in Washington. When Harry Truman disbanded the Office of Strategic Services after World War II, he was a practical man. He said, World War II is over. We don't need an international espionage agent now, so we'll just disband it. So the spooks, as they were called, they didn't want to lose their jobs. So they herded themselves over to the State Department to bide their time until they could reorganize. And while they were at the State Department, they were under the leadership of Evren Kirkpatrick. He was the head of our espionage service during its period of dormancy until they reorganized it as the Central Intelligence Agency under Alan Dulles. And um, Alan Dulles was a partner in the law firm of Sullivan and Cromwell in New York. And the founder of that firm, William Nelson Cromwell, had been denounced in Congress as the most dangerous revolutionary in the United States. This is all a matter of congressional record. I have it in my books. I have it in the World Order. I have it in the Rape of Justice. And John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles' brother, became Eisenhower's Secretary of State, and Alan Dulles was the head of our intelligence system. Now, what many people do not know, and I have this completely documented in my book, The World Order, the Central Intelligence Agency was set up during World War II as the Office of Strategic Services. It was nothing but a subsidiary of the British Secret Intelligence Service, the SIS, which dated back to the establishment of the Bank of England in 1694. And that also is a very interesting story, which I have in my book, how the Amsterdam bankers first financed Oliver Cromwell to overthrow the monarchy of England, the Stuart dynasty. He did so, but he, wasn't a, he died without uh, an heir, and the Stuarts came back briefly. So then the bankers financed William of Orange, and he came over and became King William III, William, William and his wife, Queen Mary. And one of the first things that he did was to charter the Bank of England. Soon after, the uh, Bank of England set up the Secret Intelligence Service, which has persisted to the present day. The aristocrats who bought the original stock in the Bank of England made their fortune in the slave trade. When the worldwide opposition to the slave trade began to voice itself early in the 19th century. They found an even more profitable business in the international drug trade. When the Emperor of China objected to the East India Company, which was a subsidiary of the Bank of England, when this emperor resisted the debauching of his people by the East India Company and their opium imports, the British fought three opium wars against the people of China and subdued the emperor and continued their drug business. One of the greatest drug merchants of that period was an American named Warren Delano. And Warren Delano's daughter became the mother of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
And when Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, became president, he named his uncle, Frederick Delano, as the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, Virginia. But previously, Frederick Delano had been named to the original board of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors in 1914. So you had a very close link between Drug Incorporated, the worldwide drug business, and the Federal Reserve System. Now, you may have seen a few stories in recent months that the Federal Reserve banks are the principal uh, banks which are laundering the money for the international drug trade. That is absolutely true. But what people don't know is that the Federal Reserve System has always been closely connected with the world drug trade. And because you had a very prominent scion of a financial family in Washington named George Bush, he was named as director of the Central National Intelligence Agency, which was and is the principal agency directing the worldwide operations of Drug Incorporated. George Bush came from a banking house called Brown Brothers Harriman. The Harriman Railroad fortune was itself a Rothschild operation. E. H. Harriman was financed in the Union Pacific uh, Railroad by Jacob Schiff of Coon Loeb Company, the same banking house which sent Paul Warburg to Jekyll Island to write the Federal Reserve Act in 1910. One of the fascinating things about the research I've done over the past 40 years is that it becomes easier each year because I run into the same names no matter what, whether I'm investigating the medical monopoly, the legal monopoly, or the money monopoly. There are the same people. I already have their complete histories, their family histories, their business histories. So it's a very easy task to put these pieces into the puzzle. <clears throat> now the firm of Brown Brothers Harriman for many years had an English branch called Brown Shipley. And Brown Shipley Company, by tradition, always furnished the head of the Bank of England, who was called the governor of the Bank of England. And one partner of Brown Shipley Company, Sir Montague Norman, was the head of the Bank of England for longer than any other person in history, from 1896 to 1944. And in 1928, Sir Montague Norman met with Benjamin Strong of the Federal Reserve Board, and they plotted deliberately the great crash of 1929 and the ensuing depression. Because this depression allowed these international bankers to pick up American companies, American banks, for a fraction of their value, for pennies. And it gave them that much more monetary and political control. Also, Sir Montague Norman has another claim to fame that he, in the 1920s and 1930s, financed the Nazi regime and the career of Adolf Hitler. So if you want to be anti-Nazi and if you want to be anti-Hitler, you should know that without the Bank of England, there would never have been an Adolf Hitler at the helm of Germany, and there probably would never have been a Second World War. And also, in 1916, Jacob Schiff of Kuhn Loeb Company had been, for the past 20 years, spending a large portion of his personal fortune to finance communist propaganda in Russia against the Tsar. And that task was taken over by a, a large group of New York financiers they set up a company called American International Corporation. The sole function of American International was to continue the financing of the coming Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. One of the directors of American International, and it had some of the most august names in American finance in it, Percy Rockefeller and others, one of the names of the directors was George Herbert Walker. George Herbert Walker was a St. Louis financier who went to New York and became the president of W.A. Harriman Company, which later became Brown Brothers Harriman. 
and uh, George Herbert Walker's daughter married a man named Prescott Bush, who entered the firm of Brown Brothers Harriman, and they had a son whom they named after her father, George Herbert Walker Bush, the present president of the United States. So here again, much of my research has been into family dynasties. Now many of our early presidents have been outsiders, like Ronald Reagan, he was a Hollywood figure, he was not a domestic figure, he had no interest or any stake in the international financial scene. So what they did was they simply threw him a few crumbs now and then. When he was ready to leave the White House, they bought him a nice home in California, sort of a pension plan, and uh, so he was taken care of. But he was never in any way a family member of the international world order. Now these so-called anti-communist right-wing organizations, which you may have heard of in recent years, such as American Enterprise Institute, Heritage Foundation, the Georgetown Center for Strategic and International Studies, the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. These are all run by a very small group of people. Gene Kirkpatrick is a member of most of them. And they also can be traced directly back to the Trotskyite organization, the League for Industrial Democracy. This is all a matter of record. And they pretty much direct the CIA and its oper worldwide operations today. Now, I spoke in Florida, and a lady, I spoke at some length about the Heritage Foundation and the numerous links which its uh, directors had with the uh, World Order. She said, you know, I just sent them a check for $1,000. I certainly wish I hadn't sent it. But she said, I'm not going to send them anymore. And if any of you are supporting any of these fake right-wing organizations, I urge you to look around, find out what your money is being spent for, find out what their program is, find out what Jean Kirkpatrick is up to, because she was known during her years in New York, she was known as Miss Israel, because she defended every atrocity committed by the State of Israel against Palestinian women and children and children. Every bullet fired into those civilians in uh, Palestine was paid for by the American taxpayer. You taxpayers pay every Israeli soldier $12,000 a year. So they have a free hand to do whatever they want to maintain their occupation of the West Bank, to deny the Palestinian people their autonomy, and to give them the nation which they strive for and the position in the world which they strive for. Now, I had a friend on the House Banking Currency Committee named Congressman Wright Patman. He spent most of his congressional career trying to find out two things. He wanted to find out who actually owned the stock of the Federal Reserve Banks, and he wanted to conduct an audit of the Federal Reserve System. He died without ever attaining either of those objectives. But after I was able to obtain the original organizational charts of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks in 1983, I was able from those charts to find out the principal stockholders of the major stockholders of the Federal Reserve Banks for the first time. Now there are a number of congressmen battling to audit the Federal Reserve System to bring them up to date to find out what they've been doing. You also have Congressman Hamilton, who is trying to lift the veil of secrecy from the Federal Reserve uh, Board meetings. They have what they call the Federal Open Market Committee, which has absolute control over the daily price of money and the daily quantity of money throughout the United States. This means they can dictate whether the stock market shall go up or the stock market shall go down. Now, to have that information ahead of time is worth millions of dollars to anybody. anybody. So this is why they say they must operate in absolute secrecy. But these same governors of the Federal Reserve System are appointed by these, by these banks, and 
you can be pretty certain that the chief stockholders of those banks have some idea of which way things are going to go. Uh, they have some way of making their wishes known to the Board of Governors. When Paul Volcker was named chairman of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors in, uh, by President Jimmy Carter, the New York Times stated that uh, Volcker had been actually chosen by David Rockefeller and by Robert Russo. David Rockefeller was president of the Chase Manhattan Bank in New York, and Robert Russo was a partner of Brown Brothers Harriman. So you see, you have a very small crew running the affairs of the United States. And then, of course, when you had Alan Greenspan chosen as the next Board of Gov of Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Alan Greenspan came to the Federal Reserve from J.P. Morgan Company. Now, I mentioned to you in November 1910, one of the Jekyll Island conspirators was Henry A. Davison, the right-hand man of J.P. Morgan at J.P. Morgan Company. Now, here, 75 years later, you had a partner of J.P. Morgan Company chosen as the new chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. And, of course, Paul Volcker had come to Washington as the chairman of the Board of Governors from the position of president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where, and he had originally worked for the Rockefeller Bank, Chase Manhattan Bank, and he had a long history of serving the big money interests in New York. And, of course, after Paul Volcker became chairman of the board, we had the most ruinous inflation that we've had in many years. We had 25 percent. You may remember those tough years when many automobile dealers, home builders, contractors were forced out of business because the interest rate had skyrocketed to a point that they could not sell a car or they could not sell a house. This is the power which the Federal Reserve Board of Governors has over every citizen of the United States. As I say, I went to see George Hansen in 1983, and he was on the Federal Reserve uh, Board. Uh, he was on the Federal Reserve Subcommittee of the House Banking and Currency Committee. I talked to him, and I talked to Ron Paul, who was also on that committee. They were both subsequently defeated in their reelection bids for Congress. George Hansen was not only defeated for Congress, by the active intervention of IRS agents in his home state of Idaho. They went to every contributor uh, in his campaign, and they threatened them with audits, and they put pressure on them, and George Hansen wound up being defeated. They also put him in prison because they had passed an ethics bill in Congress which set up certain bookkeeping regulations which a congressman were supposed to follow. It was so complicated, no congressman knew how to do it. George Hansen sought help from other congressmen and from lawyers, and he filled it out to the best of his ability. Later on, they singled out George Hansen, no other congressman, and said that he had not filled it out correctly, therefore he was in violation. He was sent to prison, he was paroled, and I was on the podium with George Hansen a number of times. We spoke in Dallas, and at that meeting, the agents were there to pick him up and return him for violation of parole. But he and I went out to lunch out a side door, and they missed us. So the next day, they arrested him while he was speaking at a religious meeting at Omaha, Nebraska. They flew him to uh, Washington, they put him in prison under an assumed name so that no one knew where he was. He had his hands manacled behind his back at all times, and uh, George was a heavy-set man, about 260 pounds. Then they took him down to Petersburg Federal Prison in Virginia to serve out the rest of his sentence. The treatment meted out to him was so brutal that 268 congressmen signed a petition to the President of the United States to ameliorate his conditions or even to grant him parole. Hundreds of thousands of letters and telegrams were sent to the White House asking for clemency for George Hansen. That was totally ignored 
because George Hansen had to be gotten rid of because he told me he was in line to become the next chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee. In that position, he would have had absolute authority over the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. They were determined they were not going to let George Hansen be reelected. They were going to get him out of Congress. They did get him out of Congress. He's out of Congress today. He served every day of his sentence without parole, as though he had been the most hardened criminal in the United States. This was a man who had never offended anybody, had never gotten even a parking ticket. And the Washington Post even commented Riley on the editorial page. They said, the Department of Justice would have you believe that the streets of Washington are safer today because George Hansen is in prison. But this is what happens when you offend the secret powers of the world order, control our government. Ron Paul ran for president of the United States on the Libertarian Party. I had advised both George Hansen and Ron to run for president as Republicans. They were Republicans. They had been in Congress as Republicans. I said, run as Republicans. Go into your party. But no, they decided to be independents, which meant they had to raise money. They got no media attention whatsoever. And of course, uh, I doubt if uh, any of you saw uh, Ron Paul's many speeches during the 1984 campaign. He was only allowed to appear on CNN and various cable networks. He never got any major news coverage. And another acquaintance of mine, David Duke of Louisiana, ran uh, for president on the Populist Party ticket. He also got absolutely no media attention. And in fact, when they had a meeting of, of presidential candidates, a debate between presidential candidates at Tulane University in, in Louisiana, I was down there at that time, they refused to allow David Duke to participate in that meeting because he would have gotten media attention. He was absolutely frozen out. They would not let him into the building. So then, after the presidential campaign, David Duke decided to run for an opening in the state legislature. And the people of his district, the working class district in Louisiana, Metairie, Louisiana, they worked very hard. They house to house canvassed, and they let the people know that David Duke wanted to represent them. And they elected him overwhelmingly, despite the fact that the entire upper echelon of the Republican Party came down and campaigned against him for his opponent. And uh, it backfired on them because it was so flagrant what they were doing, so blatant, that the people said, we're not going to be dictated to by Washington. We are going to elect our own state representative. And they did exactly that. After he was elected, Lee Atwater, the Republican uh, National Committee leader, wanted to have the legislature refuse to seat David Duke, who had been legally elected. Other leading Republicans, including George Bush himself, tried to stop David Duke from being seated in the legislature. They couldn't do it. They were defeated. They walked away with egg on their faces, and David Duke is sitting in the Louisiana legislature today, where he is almost the only member who is battling against higher taxes, battling against a greater extension of the bureaucracy. And this is what we need all over the United States. We need for local people to elect their own representatives. We need to defeat the well-paid minions of the world order who intend to bind more chains upon us. And we have to defend ourselves on every level. This is the problem. This is what the Constitution wanted us to do. They set up the safeguards. It is up to us to live by those safeguards and to defend our nation and our Constitution. Thank you. from the audience.
Yes. Uh, Yusuf, you mentioned that the, um, the IRS collects the tax money and then they truck it directly to the Federal Reserve Banks in their respective uh, region. That's right. Of which there are 12. Yep. How do they um, um, account for all of this? Are they ever audited so we, we know exactly how much money went to the Federal Reserve Bank? You know, there's never been an audit of the Federal Reserve System, and I believe this is one reason that uh, the congressmen are so anxious to audit the Federal Reserve to find out uh, how much of this tax money that is being extorted from our citizens is actually getting to the government. And this is a very important point because when the IRS comes after you, they want every penny, and you as a citizen should find out where every penny of that money goes. You have a right to that information. Well, you're saying that the, um, the Federal Reserve Bank is controlling, uh, was it the fiscal administration of the, um, the money system? Well, the actual fiscal administration through the uh, Department of the Treasury is controlled by bureaucrats who themselves are appointed by uh, the President of the United States as part of the executive department. And of course, the President of the United States, his campaign is always financed by the uh, uh, Federal Reserve Banks themselves. In other words, if you want to run for office, you are not going to get any money from the bankers. But they only give money to their own candidates. And of course, they give money to both parties. That's a tradition. So that shows that they're nonpartisan, you see. So again, we really don't know how the tax money gets back to the people. We do not, absolutely not. That is a process which has been shrouded in as much secrecy as the actual deliberations of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors itself. And this is uh, so important to throw light on this, and the people are beginning to realize. You see, for so many years, they didn't even know the Federal Reserve Board was there, so why would they ask any questions about it? Now. In the last 10 years, there has been much more public awareness about the fact that we do have a Federal Reserve System. Now we have to ask the question, what is it doing and what is it doing to us? And these are the questions which are being beginning to be asked in Washington, and I think we're going to get some answers one way or another. Well, why can't uh, Congress uh, have the IRS audited? Well. Uh, the IRS itself, apparently, because it is a tool of the Federal Reserve Board, is uh, not really a government agency, and uh, no one knows how to go about having it audited because they don't know exactly what it is. Okay, so neither the IRS nor the Federal Reserve Bank are part of the government. No, they're not. Although, when I sued the uh, IRS, I had to sue the Commissioner of Internal Revenue uh, at the Department of the Treasury Building. The IRS offices are in the Treasury Building. Um, I might uh, mention about uh, my forthcoming book, The Rape of Justice, which is an expose of the legal monopoly and which recounts a number of my lawsuits. I have handled my own lawsuits for some 40 years. And I was in a lawsuit against a man who had tried to kill me, rammed his car into me, and uh, then, he, of course, he wouldn't pay. And so I sued him. And his lawyer, who was a very prominent lawyer, told me one day, I, we had had legal maneuvers for about a year. We'd gone through what they call pretrial discovery, depositions, and all this sort of stuff. And uh, I had filed a lot of motions myself. And so, uh, and I'd also sued his lawyer along the way. And uh, so, uh, this lawyer stopped me one morning as I was going by his office, and he said, uh, Mr. Mullins, and I said, yes. He said, uh, uh, and I kept walking. I didn't want to talk to him because, you know, uh, I only saw him in court. He said, I just want to tell you something. I said, what's that? And he said, well, you, you're not going to be a problem to us much longer. And I said, well, why do you think so? He said, because the IRS is going to take care of you. And I said, I have no problem with the IRS. And he said, well, you do now. So the next day, I got a letter summoning me for an audit. So I promptly typed up a lawsuit and filed it against the Internal Revenue Service agent for $350,000, charging him with terrorism because I was terrified. 
I mean, you know, being summoned for an audit is a terrifying experience. And so uh, I thought since I'd been terrorized, I had grounds for a lawsuit. So I filed suit against him, and this, of course, I don't think anyone had ever done this before, and uh, it caused consternation in their offices. And so uh, when I went in for my audit, of course, they knew all about the lawsuit. And I took two friends with me and a tape recorder. And I'm not very mechanical, and I didn't know how to work the tape recorder, so I set it on the desk, and I kept trying to turn it on. I didn't know how to turn it on, so, so anyway, the agent was just staring at the tape recorder. He wouldn't look at me. He kept staring at the tape recorder as though it were a bomb or something. And uh, so these two friends began to argue with him. I uh, sat back and let them, uh, he said, who are these people? And I said, they're citizens of the United States. He said, well, why are they here? He said, I summoned you. And I said, they're here because they are interested in what goes on here. And then this lady, she was quite truculent. She said, uh, well, you know, I pay your salary. And the agent shot back. He said, oh, no, you don't. You don't pay my salary. And she said, oh, yes, I do. So they were hammering away, and I was just sitting back and enjoying the whole thing. So finally, the agent's uh, supervisor stepped out. He had been hiding behind the door, if you can believe this. He'd been hiding behind the door. He st stepped out from behind the door in this uh, conference room, and he said, well, the audit is concluded. And I said, how could it be concluded? I said, uh, I was uh, summoned here to talk to you about my you know, tax situation. He said, well, I'm declaring it over. And of course, we had also argued about the tape recorder. They claimed that you could not have the tape recorder there. And this lady jumped on him and said, yes, you can have the tape recorder there. And so uh, after about 20 minutes of this, he said the audit is concluded. So then a few months went by, and I got an assessment for a deficiency. Did you drop the lawsuit? Uh, I kept the lawsuit. As I, I filed it in federal, in uh, state court because I was a citizen of the state, state of Virginia. They promptly remanded it to federal court, and I filed an 18-page memorandum citing the U.S. statutes uh, that it be remanded back to state court, and we carried this on for about a year. So finally, uh, they got it dismissed without a hearing, but during that time, I filed 38 motions, including 11 motions to halt for an injunction to halt the collection of all income taxes in the United States until these important constitutional principles of my lawsuit had been resolved or resolved. Now, of course, they didn't want to halt the collection of all income taxes in the United States. So they didn't, never heard my motions, and they finally dismissed the suit without a hearing. Shortly after that, I got a notice of deficiency. So uh, I filed with the U.S. Tax Court. And uh, because of my unique personal history, uh, I, when I first visited Ezra Pound in 1947, because he was under indictment for treason by the Department of Justice, the FBI opened a file on me, and I remained under daily surveillance by the FBI for 33 years. So uh, after some years, about 1982, a friend of mine in Chicago said he had applied and gotten his FBI file. And uh, he said, uh, why don't you apply for your FBI file? And I said, why? I wouldn't have any FBI file. I've never been arrested in my life. And uh, so he said, go ahead and send in for it anyway. So they answered my inquiry, and they said, well, yes, we have 800 pages. And uh, so I said, send it to me. And they said, they'll charge 10 cents a page. But they said, uh, we can only send you 500 pages because 300 pages of it would endanger national security if it were released. So I appealed this, and uh, they had a board meeting at the FBI, and they, they agreed that, yes, this 300 pages was so dangerous that it would imperil the national security of the United States. So I never got to 300 pages, but I got to 500 pages, and in that 500 pages was a record of this surveillance over a period of 33 years, and also there was a letter from J. Edgar Hoover, a memorandum, to the four top assistant directors of the FBI, ordering them to see to it that I would be placed in a mental institution. And um, so then they had about 30 pages of memoranda 
about how they were chasing me around and trying to get me committed to a mental institution. I knew nothing about it at the time because I had left my apartment in Chicago and gone to Michigan. Russell Kirk, a friend of mine, had lent me a cabin in uh, Lake Macosta, Michigan to write my biography of Ezra Major Pound. And of course, I was always very secretive about my movements, and I got in my car and drove off to uh, Lake Macosta without telling anybody. So at that particular time, the FBI had already uh, successfully conspired with a county judge the two agents of the FBI would pick me up at my Chicago apartment, take me before this Cook County judge, and he would commit me to an insane asylum. So um, it was all planned and would have been executed just that way, except I wasn't at home when uh, they got there. So when J. Edgar Hoover heard this, because he had issued a direct order, and it's initialed by him, I have this reproduced in my book, A Writ for Martyrs, which also reproduces 120 pages of my FBI file. And um, <clears throat> so the um, fact that he had personally ordered me to pick up and committed, and then when I wasn't home, the agents were, had to report back to him personally that they couldn't find me, which would, <laughs> of course, put them behind the eight ball. And um, so then he... he decided that someone had tipped me off because I had a close friend in the FBI, not an agent, but in the bureaucracy. And uh, in fact, I stayed with him when I was in Washington. So uh, for a number of years. So Jed Hoover decided that I had probably been tipped off and that I was so angry that I was going to come to Washington and kill him because they had repeatedly stated into my FBI file that I usually carried a gun, which was totally untrue. I hadn't owned a gun for years. But uh, they also said I was a very sloppy dresser. And uh, so and they had a lot of other stuff in there, too. It was really interesting reading. That's why I reproduced 120 pages of it, because it makes a good book. So, uh, and I would like to find out what's in the other 300 pages. But unfortunately, that 300 pages, after Jed Hoover was found mysteriously dead in bed, uh, his secretary burned all of that uh, file. So I'll never find out what it, what it was. But uh, J. Edgar Hoover, when he decided I was on my way to Washington to kill him, issued a national alert for me, and they had FBI agents watching every airport and uh, railway station and bus station in the United States. And uh, so uh, they, couldn't, they didn't find me. So finally, through a fluke, they found me at uh, Russell's camp because a friend of his had gone down to Chicago to see uh, the symphony, and I said, why don't you stay at my apartment and pick up my mail? So when he drove up behind my apartment in the alley there and, and went upstairs to uh, to uh, open the back door, he came back down, and about uh, 30 FBI agents jumped out of the dark with drawn guns and uh, flashlights in his eyes, and they were all screaming, where's Mullins? And uh, so he told them I was at Lake Macosta because there was no secret. And uh, so then they rushed off, and then he looked in his car, and they had taken his keys, because they thought it was me, you see. And so they had grabbed the keys immediately so that when I came back down, I wouldn't be able to make my getaway. Of course, how I could get away with 30 FBI agents shooting at me, I don't know, because uh, this was only two blocks from where they shot down John Dillinger at the Biograph Theater. And uh, of course, that was an execution. When he walked out, they simply filled him full of lead. And uh, they probably would have done the same to me. I don't know. So anyway, when I went before U.S. Tax Court, I had this file. And um, I filed a number of legal motions before the tax court, including a stipulation that the court recognized that the FBI and the IRS had for years been engaged in an illegal conspiracy to have me committed to a mental institution. So I went down for my hearing after about a year. And uh, uh, I chose to, to have it heard in Richmond, Virginia, which was closer to me, although I could have gone up to Washington to the main building. So when my case was called Mullins versus Commissioner, I stood up and I said, Your Honor, I, uh, I have some stipulations before the court, and I hope we'll be able to uh, uh, hear those today. And the judge shot back at me. He said, 
Mr. Mullins, the court is not going to have time to go into all that. He said, uh, what I want you to do is go in with the U.S. attorney into this conference room and you all thresh this thing up. So they weren't going to hear any of our motions because naturally they did not want a court record of a conspiracy between the FBI and the IRS to have me put in a mental institution. So uh, I went in with this young, and the IRS, by the way, did not have any representative there. Here I was suing. I was suing the Commissioner of Internal Revenue, and they sent down a U.S. attorney, not an IRS attorney at all. And so we went in the room, and this attorney started going, going over my uh, tax return. And, of course, I usually file a voluminous tax return because I'm engaged in a lot of different things. I have four international publishing companies and so forth. So uh, he started disallowing a few things, and then he allowed some other things. And uh, it wound up that um, I had no deficiency. So we went back before the judge, and he said, uh, have you gentlemen managed to reach an agreement? And the U.S. attorney said, yes, Your Honor. And I said, yes, Your Honor. So I walked out of that courtroom with a letter from the U.S. tax court that I had no tax deficiency. And that's, that was in 1982. I've never heard from him again to this day. But, uh, you know, I, t I tell friends of mine, I don't understand. Why don't they call? <laughs> but because uh, I have some other theories. I have two chapters in my new book. Uh, the Rape of Justice on Taxation, and I, uh, I have some uh, legal theories there which I would like to test in court. But as I say, uh, <laughs> I don't hear from them, so I have no way of getting in touch with them, really. The IRS seems to have vanished. How do you know that the uh, FBI has closed your file? Oh, they haven't closed my file. They claim they have. They never closed the file. Uh, I imagine that they... Um, are um, still keeping pretty uh, good track of me because, you know, I get out a book every year and I used to manage to get a few flattering references to them in there. And uh, in fact, in my biography of Ezra Pound, I had a couple of paragraphs about the uh, FBI. And uh, I found this was published in 1961, this difficult individual Ezra Pound, which is the only authorized biography of Ezra Pound. He commissioned me to write it. And um, in my file, uh, I did find that Jed Goober was extremely upset by what I had written about uh, the FBI in that book in 1961. He was, and uh, I think he wanted to have its uh, circulation stopped. And it, it sold very few copies. Well, it was remaindered almost immediately. It was published by a New York publishing company called Fleet Publishing Company, which a few months after they published my book, they went out of business. And uh, I'm afraid I've been a bad influence on the American economy in my uh, career because I've put publishing companies out of business. Newspapers that have published my articles have been closed down. I've had five radio talk hosts who have lost their shows after I appeared on them. And I appeared on Martin Downey, uh, two weeks before his show was canceled. So uh, <laughs> I've got a very bad record as far as it comes to helping out people. But uh, generally, I, I do about uh, 30 radio shows a year. And uh, I had one fellow in Denver who was canceled after I was on. He got a radio show on another station. He had me on again. I, he was canceled again. And uh, Tony Hilder, uh, who uh, now has a show in Alaska, <clears throat> he was canceled three different times in, in various California stations after I was on his show. Alan Stang of California, I was on his uh, radio show, and uh, it was, he had a very good audience. I sold uh, almost 300 copies of my Secrets of the Federal Reserve after I appeared on that show. And his show was not only canceled, but... Um, they sent him to prison for six months for failure to file. And uh, so he, <laughs> he came under a lot of pressure. But uh, you have to expect this because they will go after anybody that they can. They will intimidate anybody they can. They operate completely outside the law. Uh, for years, the FBI did black bag jobs. And um, <clears throat> I would c come into my... Uh, uh,
office at my home after being out for a couple hours. All my papers would be in disarray and whatever I'd been working on. I'd have to dig for it for two hours to find it. And this happened many times. And in fact, uh, uh, they, they had a story in the Washington Post about one man who, who said that he had carried out over 85 black bag jobs at his burglary for the FBI during his career. And um, these are people who are themselves outlaws. In the world order, I cite the U.S. statutes on criminal syndicalism, and uh, these people are liable under the statutes on criminal syndicalism, and I give those statutes. And uh, they can be arrested anywhere in the United States on the basis of those statutes alone. Plus, there are many other statutes which they're in violation of. <coughs> So, um, and that, yes. So at this point in time, you're um, choosing to pay taxes. Pardon? Are you a taxpayer yourself at this point? Well, I always say I pay anything I owe. If they can prove I owe something, I'll pay it. <laughs> so you do file with the IRS? I file, yes. I file, and uh, if they want an audit, uh, they can have an audit. And if they want. Uh, to assess a deficiency, I'll go back into tax court because there were a lot of things we didn't cover the last time I was there. So, in light of all that you know, um, can I ask the reason that you're choosing um, to file rather than take a non-filing position? Well, um, the uh, problem with the non-filing position is that they uh, come after you for what they call willful failure to file. And they could tie you up on that for quite a long time, and they have sent a lot of people to prison on it. And so I would rather send something in and let them play with it and object to it, and then we can go to court and fight about it, rather than just simply uh, challenge them on, the, uh, on who should file and so forth. Because there are plenty of people doing that. Irwin Schiff has done it, and many other people have done it, and uh, Danny has done it. And so uh, some of them have won, some have lost. I say in my book, The Rape of Justice, that when you go into American court, it's uh, Russian roulette. The prosecutor spins the uh, chamber and hands you the gun, and you put it to your head and pull the trigger. Hopefully, there's no bullet in that chamber, but you never know. That's the way our legal system works. And that's something else that we've got to correct, because there's no reason for any American citizen to go into American court and play Russian roulette. He should go in there and have his rights protected. He should get justice. There's a new book out by Gary Spence, one of the best trial lawyers in the United States, called Justice for None. In the first sentence of that book, he says, there is no justice in any American court for the people. And this is a man who knows. I've uh, been in the courts for 40 years. I know it. But people don't find this out until they actually get into court. Because they may think there's some corruption there, they may think there's some problems, but they think that you are going to get some justice. You get no justice. Go in there ready to fight. Go in there with all of the ammunition you have and be prepared for a real struggle. Because they're not going to give you anything but a hard time. And if you hire a lawyer, um, I tell people that if you go into any prison in the United States and and as a prisoner in every cell, and every one of those prisoners had a lawyer. And of course, I always represented myself. I hired lawyers a couple of times. I had to fire them because within days, I found out they were double-crossing me. And of course, you have the old saw that um, a man who represents himself in court has a fool for a lawyer. But my experience in the courts led me to believe that uh, you have to update that today, that any man who hires a lawyer is a fool. <laughs> any more questions? Yes. Um, you made a reference to alien influence. Uh huh. Was that on the Federal Reserve System or in the government, or what did you mean by that? Uh, well, that's on everything because. The American um, government today is a paper tiger. It's, it's run by various international agencies, and uh, 
Of course, you have your congressmen, and you have your Supreme Court, and you have your president and his cabinet in Washington, but they're all put there by somebody else. They were not put there by the American people. They were put there by people who put up the money for their campaigns for various reasons of their own. And they are they're not answerable to you. They're only answerable to the people who hold their notes. And this is the problem. And um, most, on most issues of national policy, uh, surveys have shown that the American people oppose 85% of the present policies of the American government. So we're being run by a small minority. Yes. So, so what are the solutions? What are the things that we can do as individuals to help, you know, solve the problem with the banking system and also in light of the inflation? You mentioned earlier that the American paper dollar is worth only one cent from its original value. Um, what can we do to protect ourselves against uh, inflation? <coughs> well, when you have an agency like the Federal Reserve Board, which can run the value of the dollar up and down every day like a window shade, it's pretty hard to protect against that. So you have to, most investment analysts will give you fairly good advice that you should have a certain amount in gold, a certain amount in stocks, a certain amount in real estate, a certain amount in cash. And that's the way most people are operating today. Uh, with this kind of situation and with uh, inflation and ever-present possibility, and they've got the mechanism set up to create as much inflation as they want to. So your best protection is to have a uh, fluid position and not be locked into one particular investment, not to have all your money in one bank and a certificate of deposit and that sort of thing. because. Uh, then you have a much better chance of uh, riding through whatever crisis they're going to cook up. Because, as I point out in The Rape of Justice, the whole idea of the law merchant, which is the law that we're under, not constitutional law, is to convert real property into debt. Our legal system, our medical monopoly, our monetary system are all designed to rob you of whatever real wealth you have and to put it into the hands of international bankers. They use the courts, they use the uh, banking system, and they use our political system for that goal. In other words, these people are, are not playing tag. They are serious about robbing you and enslaving you for, you for the rest of your life. And of course, one of the primary methods that they do that is through the medical monopoly, which I mentioned Murder by Injection, which was my latest book, and um, <clears throat> the fluoridation of water, which uh, chemically lobotomizes the people, the chlorination of water, which creates atherosclerosis, because by the chlorination of the water, and chlorine and fluorine, by the way, were surplus waste products of the big corporations, which they were spending a lot of money to get rid of, the chlorine was left over from World War I, uh, and they had no use for it whatsoever. So they put it in the water, and they said, we're making your water safe to drink. Well, the chlorine also reacts with the fats in your diet to deposit fatty deposits through your arteries, which causes strokes and heart attacks. And uh, the heart, after the chlorination of the public water supplies, the heart attack uh, ratio mounted astronomically in this country and it's continued high every year. So they tell you to jog and they tell you not to eat any butter and so forth, but as long as you're drinking that chlorinated water, you're going to get a heart attack. Uh, if you never touch butter again in your life, you're still going to get it. So, And the fluoridation, of course, uh, works on your kidneys and uh, your liver. It's a very toxic poison, which was a waste product of the Aluminum Corporation of America. And uh, in the budget of Alcoa, uh, they had a serious crisis how to dispose of this waste product uh, without incurring many millions of dollars of expense. So they put uh, their general counsel, a man named Oscar Ewing, in Washington as head of the Federal Security Agency, which also 
control the U.S. Public Health Service. And they gave Oscar Ewing a $750,000 cash bribe to quit fluoridation in through the U.S. Public Health Service. This is a matter of congressional record. I have the actual page from the congressional record. It was put in there by Congressman Adolph Miller of Nebraska. So Oscar Ewing had the U.S. Public Health Service uh, um, lobby for adoption of fluoridation of the water supply of every major city in the United States. One of the first cities to be uh, fluoridated was Washington, D.C. itself. And immediately all of the congressmen installed big water tanks in their water bottles in their offices of pure mountain water. And one senator even went to a restaurant and he carried his own flask of water. He said, I wouldn't kill myself by drinking any of that stuff. So these are the people that we elect to represent our interests. And the medical monopoly today is really, I call it murder by injection because they are poisoning the people of the United States. They are producing a more and more submissive population which is drugged, which is ill, which does not have the strength or the energy to fight back against the encroachments of our aggressive bureaucrats. This is the situation that we're in today. Now you say, what is the solution? First of all, it's like a diagnosis. When you're ill, you have to have a diagnosis. You have to diagnose what is going on today, and then you have to decide what kind of treatment you need to save your life, and you've got to get busy on that treatment. So that's where we are today. Well, I think that, uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I've enjoyed being with you this evening. Thank you very much.